Hey everybody, it's Brian Burns and welcome to this episode of the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Today we got a great entrepreneur, somebody who kind of scratched his own itch, came up with a dialing system, a, a way of integrating the telephone into the CRM and being able to determine who most likely is going to be available and connect that person up with the salesperson so the salespeople don't have to do all of that searching and determining who to call and what they care about and what the priority should be. Uh, the, the founder of Dial Source is joining us. Josh is going to tell us his story. Before we get into it, I want to make sure you're going to b2brevenue.com and registering there. Check out all the good stuff, the blog, the podcast, everything that's new over there. Uh, this week, uh, we also have the Nudge um, training. Uh, all you have to do is go to my LinkedIn profile. You'll see how I use AI to fill up my pipeline and crush my number. Uh, the course is uh, free to the podcast listener. The coupon is the word nudge to make sure you enter that so you don't get charged. Uh, and that's it. Let's get into the interview. I'll sum it up at the end. Hey, Josh, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Well, I'd say for the last 15 years, I've really dedicated my life since school uh, on uh, building out interesting infrastructure, uh, architecture, as it relates to communication, analytics, and automation. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough over the last 15 years to work on tackling some of these problems uh, with some of my closest friends from college and some of my closest friends even before that. Uh, and we really have been able to um, build an interesting product and an interesting technology uh, by pursuing our passion. Ed, how'd you get interested in this? Uh, you know, it was a combination of curiosity, inexperience, uh, and I'd say some uh, over-ambitious drive, perhaps. Uh, I was doing an internship or a series of internships throughout Wall Street while doing my undergraduate at University of California. And in learning sales processes, techniques, and applying economics and computer science background, I stumbled into making outbound calls in sales and service research for these internships. And I quickly realized the fundamental problem and how difficult it was to find a live person to have a relevant conversation with when you're calling by hand, and then to take it another step further when you did, and if you were just getting out to learn, it was very difficult to have a successful cadence in that pitch. And from there, and probably a handful of beers on a patio in college, um, I convinced a, a handful of buddies that there was a better way than the standard predictive dialer that could be used to make these high outbound volume calls, but had this very in intimate experience. And really started out with uh, the theology of this, which turned into a paper that was published while an undergrad at the University of California. And later down the road, we then decided to pursue that paper and start building some initial prototypes of what then became known as the refractive dialer in the very early 2000s. Yeah, because that was the time when everybody was basically adopting CRM. Before then, everyone had it, but no one used it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I would say, I would say, but it was still very early. I mean, look at Salesforce.com. It was founded in 1999, so you're talking early 2000s. Still, CRM and, and cloud, especially in the enterprise, uh, was a relatively new new thing. I mean, cloud existed for Amazon and for other applications. Uh, but yes, to your point, uh, CRM back then, 10, 12 years ago, was a very different animal than it is today. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't see. I mean, I remember back then that you know companies owned it, but, uh, you know, it was the type of thing that, you know, once a month or once a Friday, people updated it so the forecast could come out of it as a spreadsheet. And yes, yeah, so it wasn't, never mind the, the ability to have power dialers or any kind of integration with the phone. You know, that was all better. sure. Even the, the, the ecosystem, the app exchange, you know, didn't really exist back then. It was still in its infancy. So that whole ability to tie uh, products and build product to solution to work within what became the CRM and platform was still very, very early. So you clearly saw a problem. 
At, at, I saw a problem that result that revolved around the fact that I could not make enough calls to the right people and have relevant conversations as an individual. And I thought if I had this problem, then there were likely other individuals that had this problem. But I had no idea the size and scope of the actual problem, only with a couple interns internships under my belt, um, still still in school. Uh, and so uh, that became a fascinating problem that the deeper we dove with engineering and economic backgrounds, the larger the problem became and the more difficult an associated solution. Uh, we basically spent the next 10 years uh, building and solving for that problem uh, while also kind of meddling around with business component basically keep the lights on, the servers running, but really focusing on the engineering side of things for 10 straight years. Uh, and that was really what became a large differentiator uh, between the, pro the, the college paper, the prototype, and then now what's a leading class solution uh, within enterprise organizations uh, all over the world. So, you know, that's it. How did you keep the lights on? Did you have a handful of, you know, um, customers that you know, bought into this vision that you had been working with, you know, very tightly? Uh, yeah, it was this kind of amalgamation uh, of the prototype being built in my home office with some friends that I was using in internships, which then I positioned into real estate as that was a, a market that was we were catching the tail end of start mid 2000s in a recessionary period but we started uh, i started selling the product in its very early stages to real estate and insurance brokers throughout northern california within a couple within our first year we, we did six figures in um, in revenue uh, and that was enough to go from a few heads to a few more heads uh, from other friends from other uc campuses and we were basically all engineers. I was primary sales. I was taking out the idea and the product uh, onto the street and knocking on office doors or making those calls on our own product of book meetings. Uh, and that went on for, for several years where we kind of just hovered in the, the low, very, very low seven-figure revenue stream. But that was enough for us to um, slowly grow our headcount, fund our research and development. Uh, we were unique in the fact that we were designing our own hardware and our own carrier network and our own software at the same time, uh, which is a very expensive endeavor in all measures, opportunity cost, time, dollars. Uh, but that allowed us to really focus on the problem and building a solution to that problem as opposed to the typical modus operandi of, I've got an idea, let me go raise some funds, and now I have a whole other goal set of, I've got to make my investors happy as opposed to being very myopic on problem solution. Uh, and that allowed us to really focus on technology and the application of this custom technology wrapped around very large, complicated problems. Well, take us through a couple of those, the, the ones that are, are the hairiest that you guys really excel at. Sure. I would really consider our company over the last better part of a decade and a half over three major inflection points. There's really the, the college paper that turned into the refractive dial of prototype and the initial problem we were solving at that point was the mathematical and fundamental problem of a predictive dialer. Uh, how, when everybody's received that call in sales, you pick up the phone, you hear nothing for a few seconds, yeah. then a beep or a click, and somebody's on the phone trying to sell you something. I got this call just the other day and it was 20 seconds before I heard a live person on the phone. This was earlier this week. In fact, this, this problem still exists. So we were the first product to mathematically solve that latency so we could use algorithmic decisions to get live people on the phone instantaneously. So if the refractive dialer was making calls, you were on a list, uh, you answered the phone, I would hear you on the phone instantaneously and see all the information within, let's say, Salesforce on that conversation. And so that's how we initially started having a targeted approach of large outbound call volume without introducing the fundamental technological flaw of dead air and latency. And that was the first probably five or six years of our organization. And as we started to go from small medium business, the mom and pop, the five and 10, then the 20, and then the 50 user businesses. And as CRM itself grew, and as we had unique ability to build this custom and native technology, we had unique viewpoints 
into the problems that all kinds of businesses were trying to solve, whether it was professional sports as clients or nonprofits or, or, or um, technology companies, that there seemed to be a large disconnect and a disparity between the phone system that sits on the desk the CRM system, the database which it sits upon, and the other related systems. And so we moved into our next iteration of technology called Dial Source in the late 2000s, around the 2008, 2009 timeframe we released it. And that product shifted and built upon the original premise. But now we were focusing on deriving data from the phone itself and the conversation and passing that data into CRM, Salesforce.com and then creating automation, analytics, and deep reporting on things like how many people do we have to call before we have a conversation? When we do have a conversation with that lead or contact, how long did we speak to them as it relates to what product or service? And from that data, we would then sequence deep layers of automation, which are the bane of the salesperson's existence, which is after I have a conversation, good or bad, I may have to do five, 10, or 15 things in CRM at the end of the conversation, like updating fields, sending emails, maybe convert the lead into an account and open a revenue opportunity. And we realized it was not only problematic and time consuming for the rep, but the opportunity cost of the rep getting the next solid lead or contact on the phone. And so what we started realizing was the reps didn't want to take the time to log the activities within the CRM Yet management and executives were spending fortunes, literally on technology, to try and gain insight and intelligent from rep behavior so that they can then use things like AI to predict how to sell and service. And we started realizing that it was completely disparate. The Cisco desk phone, the power dialer, they were not passing information to CRM. And so for the next three or four years, we started releasing this unique solution that then wound up dominating on the Salesforce App Exchange. And even today, it says the number one rated communication system worldwide for Salesforce. It's the number two rated support application for Salesforce. And I believe we're at the sixth ranked application in all categories for Salesforce. And it really is because we're solving these disparate problems. Even forwarding to more current, I'm sorry, but even forwarding to more current, uh, in today's solution, we realized we had to take those type of things from our dial source solution and then translate them into inbound phone calls and deep automation and analytics and the customer engagement. And not only do we need to drive these data points and how we're calling leads and contacts, but how all that information has to intelligently route in when a contact with an open revenue opportunity calls in, we make sure to leverage all this data and get that leader contact to the right person on our team. And that is a new way in which large organizations are improving sales and service experiences while also increasing output of their sales team and requiring their, le their reps to do and interact less in CRM, even though that sounds a bit counterintuitive. Well, it sounds like you're biting off a lot, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> uh, it, it does. But that's that's what we've been around for the last uh, better part of 15 years. And so it's been an evolution yeah. over time, uh, not just we've been around for the last 24 or 36 months tackling a lot. And, and what does it look like today? Is it a cloud service? Is it a piece of hardware? What is it, a combination or... From, the, from a client's perspective, it's completely 100% cloud-based, uh, whether it's for Salesforce.com or whether it's for Microsoft Dynamics. It's minutes to configure, uh, and it's probably hours um, to deploy across large organizations uh, because of the fact it's top to bottom native within the CRM. So it means that we sit with inside of Salesforce, we're uh, uh, adhering to profiles, to roles, to permissions, to page layouts, to make sure that all this configuration that an organization has already done in Salesforce or Microsoft, we can take advantage of, not have an external integration. And another web portal that a manager or admin has to configure outside of their CRM and then figure out like a Lego piece how to snap into their existing business processes. And because we come right in and sit within it, it's very easy to deploy, even though the technology can help to streamline quite a lot across entire sales and service teams. And, and, and who falls in love with it? Is it the rep? Is it the manager? Is it both? It's a great question. So 
it, it brings me to one of the talk tracks that I, I'm fond of right now, which is I really think that the last 10 years of CRM has been built around the executive and around the manager so that they can try and gain intelligence in what's happening in the CRM. And it also brings me to another fundamental point that I don't necessarily believe that dials equal dollars. This smile and dial mentality has evolved, and I believe that conversations create relationships, and relationships drive revenue opportunity. And so if we can use actionable intelligence, and we can use automation to get the right leads and right contacts on the phone, we can drive those intimate conversations. So in a roundabout way to answer that question, what happens is we believe technology should be built to facilitate the increase of rep output with less time and energy. But that then accomplishes what management wants by increasing output and logging in. So initially it's sales leaders that come to dial source that are looking to bring the data from the phone calls into CRM, automate these processes, log them into CRM, and track how many conversations we need to have for how long before we drive and manage revenue. What happens from the rep side is they're no longer fighting with 15 different tabs in their browser and their phone and then logging activities. So reps drive adoption of our platform in unprecedented pace as a result of being able to increase their output, which drives more sales and commissions, while making their lives simple and easier along the way. And by identifying what the top reps are doing and saying, in CRM and then automating those processes and procedures, we can take that bottom one third of reps that might struggle with process and procedure or maybe not learn quite as fast and automate the best processes from our top one third and then bring up the entire output of our sales teams, which has this very deep morale strengthening within large organizations and whether we're representing uh, the big of big like the ADPs um, that have more than a thousand users on our platform, growing like crazy, um, or whether it's the large sports organizations like the Madison Square Garden or the Sacramento Kings or the 49ers, um, we see this effect happen time and time again. Well, well, that's it because for you know the last couple of years, a lot of people have been focusing on you know the integration of the email into the CRM, so that you know there the weren't as many steps, but the phone was always the uh, you know off to the side that required the rep to do a whole lot of work. And, and it really comes down to the fact that how difficult it is. Like when you think about um, a web application or email, uh, if I send you an email and there's a hiccup in my internet or your internet, you just requery the server and re-pull down the packets. When you or I are in a live conversation, I can't requery what you said a billionth of a second ago. The level of compliance necessary to manage a carrier network is much higher than that, I believe, of just a web application itself. And so the barriers to entry and the difficulty to scale from SMB to enterprise level communications is, in my opinion, again, extremely difficult. And are you seeing traction on the on the service side as well? Call centers to, you know, on the customer service side? Absolutely. So when we when we were started out in that first iteration, and even when we were in the second iteration, dial dial source for Salesforce, it was outbound dialing, deep automation, deep analytics, and that was generally for sales. But we started learning that there were other aspects that bled in both sales and service, things like renewals and account retention, where we started seeing organizations make outbound dials to contacts, perhaps with an open technical case. As it relates to an opportunity to say, let's get this client's problem solved so they can then go buy more product from us. And so we had more clients saying, gee, uh, dial source, we love all this automation analytics on the outbound side. And it's providing all this insight to us, but we're flying in the dark for inbound phone calls. Somebody calls in, they have to hit the phone tree, press one or two or three or four, navigate through the phone tree. And then we have to introduce ourselves and ask them who they are, yeah. look them up in CRM, and then ask what we can do for them. And so in the, the newer iteration of DialSource, which has been out for the last year and a half or two, Denali, we solved that problem 
by flipping our technology in the outbound. So when Brian calls into dial source, we would recognize your phone number against a contact with an open opportunity related to an account that I, Josh, own. I have the skills in Salesforce or Microsoft uh, uh, rolled out in my profile. I'm available to take a call. I'm on the right team. And it pops up in CRM on my screen with the name, the phone number. When I click answer, DialSource presents me all that information on the screen in real time. And this is twofold in the fact that one from the customer engagement and experience, they're no longer spending four or five minutes self-sourcing information through that IVR phone tree, only to just spend another four or five minutes explaining to the rep who they are and what they want. With our solution and in this inbound ability to dynamically and real-time identify information in the CRM and route it intelligently means we're improving and flattening the customer engagement for a service experience and improving the experience for the rep on the output side of things. And when you really think about it, that could be sales or service. Maybe I called you three times as a lead. We had one really good conversation. He said, I need to think about this. Uh, I'm budgeting right now. Our fiscal opens up uh, uh, in the next two weeks. You call me back in five days. I need to know that we had those conversations, that there's an opportunity about to occur and have that intelligent conversation. So that could be an inbound phone call where you say, all right, I ran the budget. I'm ready to go. Give me an extra 5% deal, and I'll sign it today. That's an inbound phone call. And then the dial source dispositions and automation could open that revenue opportunity, create a task for our implementation or customer success management team to onboard and welcome you as a net new account. And then, of course, once you become an account, there's going to be calls out to say, hey, our engineering team's released all kinds of new stuff. Let's get you on a call so we can walk you through it. Or maybe you are having a technical issue or you're having a new rep being on board. You need to call us. We need to be able to identify this stream of data as it relates to outbound calls for sales and service and inbound calls for sales and service because the lines are blurry between a sales team and just net new and increasing and expanding product and service. And, and what are sales leaders not getting about this? Uh, do they just not know that it's available, that uh, technology has kind of leapfrogged what they thought a power dialer was? Uh, I'd say it's, it's all of, all of the uh, components that you mentioned to a degree um, and, and, and several others. One of, one of the big issues is that uh, even with the best intent, a lot of organizations that have adopted CRM over the years have had changing headcount. That CRM has gotten kind of messy over time and a bit bloated. And so if that is the case, that also affects the ecosystem of tools and technologies that they can address. Uh, and so I think that's a, a current challenge within CRM itself is um, kind of taking this minimalistic approach to making sure that your engine's running smooth, that the fluids are getting changed on a regular basis, like one would for the engine of their car. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let their Toyota go five years without servicing it. Um, I think that's an issue that requires some attention and prevents people from making change and makes them risk adverse. Um, I think one of the, the, the other issues is, and maybe the most important issues, is the fear of adoption of technology by the sales team, as in this context. So what I mean by that is um, we've thrown, I'm using a we as an example, just as any company acts. Uh, we've adopted five pieces of technology that cost us a lot of money over the last 24 months, and we didn't have great adoption of the technology across any of the rep's teams. And so we don't have the insight that we tried to gain, even though we spent all the money on it. And so I think oftentimes it's underestimated the importance of not just adopting technology, but also thinking through operational and procedural changes to match that new technology. And that's a challenging thing that we've learned over the last decade and a half of our own success and growth, that we've had to build deep customer success management teams and implementation teams because we see so much of this across so many organizations. We want our clients to know that we're extremely experienced in this and we have deep relationships in organizations that have succeeded in this to help mitigate those um, fears. Uh, but those are, those are a couple of big ones. Um, also, obviously, complexity of phone systems um, uh, is intimidating um, to, to many people because it's just a complicated thing of Pandora's box, let's say, of uh, uh, landlines and cell phones and bring your own devices and uh, sunsetting type of desk phones. Uh, and that's a complicated issue uh, that is uh, not getting, I don't think, enough attention on how to 
uh, properly solve this complicated problem. And that, I think, is scary to a lot of organizations. And, and who's the ideal client for you? As, as crazy as it may sound, it's any organization that's making or receiving phone calls that's either using Microsoft Dynamics or Salesforce.com as their system of record. Um, whether they have Cisco phones or cell phones or they use VoIP, it's irrelevant for hardware and software agnostic. Field sales, inside sales, same for service. Um, and, and we have a broad footprint, whether it's large players uh, across uh, Wall Street or across Silicon Valley or, or, or big nonprofits like American Diabetes Association. The commonality is these organizations have sales and service teams that are making phone calls, driving and servicing product that use CRM to capture this information. And the disparity between the systems means reps are not taking the time to accurately log everything they're doing. And that is not creating intelligent reports in CRM for management to make more rapid, accurate, and intelligent decisions. So anybody that's looking to solve these type of problems are fantastic uh, people or organizations to have entry dialogues into what are you currently capturing in your sales and service process? Is it just the amount of dials one makes within the team? Or are you looking to gain more insight, like how many conversations do we have on average, and how long do conversations last before a product is is closed one. And when that type of questions start coming up, those become the really qualified um, organizations to dive into the intelligence behind the call. And for the sales leaders that are listening to this and they say, wow, I didn't even know about this. How do they go about learning more about it? We can be reached on all different uh, uh, channels. So obviously, the main one being dialsource.com. Uh, you can engage directly with our sales and service teams on our site. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, in our chat, we're on the Salesforce App Exchange is one of the top solutions, so you can find us there. Uh, we are beginning to do these thought leadership pieces where we are uh, bringing some of our top clients into webinars to talk about when you had this problem for several hundred reps, how did you go about thinking about it? How did you go about solving it? What were the challenges? And we want to be able to bring this experience bubbling up to the top. So other organizations that are starting to have those questions and concerns can use the resources of the ecosystem we've worked very diligently to build over the last decade and a half. And so we, we'd be happy to have conversations uh, in regard academically, practically, et cetera. As you can tell, Josh is clearly a man on a mission, and he's really just crushing the old school alternatives that you see out there from like inside sales. It's like they just taken their market away. It's such a much better product, a better solution. It's kind of the next generation of this type of dialing capability of putting the phone and the CRM connected together so that salespeople don't have to enter all this data. You know, I, I just remember when. You know, every company demanded you use uh, the CRM. This happened, you know, almost 10, 15 years ago. Before then, everyone kind of ignored it and just used spreadsheets and had a checkbox item that, yeah, yeah, we have a CRM. Yeah, <laughs> and somebody put something into it. But this is really the smart way to do it today, and it's working really well for his clients. He's got huge clients, Madison Square Garden. Wow, I mean, these huge companies with big call centers, but it can also work for smaller ones as well that want to just be able to make the phone a very powerful capability within their selling system. So make sure you check it out, dialsource.com. They've got quite a bit of information there, uh, a lot of uh, webinars and eBooks uh, to learn about exactly how it all works and how you can get the benefit of it. Hey, did you check out last week's episode where I had Udi, the, the CMO from Gong.io? Man, that man is on a mission. He He's moving to San Francisco from Israel, and he, he has the attitude that I want to hear from with CMOs. And it's just fantastic. You know, really wants to make that revenue contribution and dominate his market segment. So make sure you're checking that out. Also, check out the, the course, How I Use AI uh, to Fill Up My Pipeline. It's free with the coupon nudge. At just And make sure you enter that when you check out and make sure the balance is zero. 
Uh, so th- there's going to be no refunds if there's any mistakes. I, I just don't have time for it. But also check out the other two courses. Uh, to start the conversation and get the meeting is just cooking. Our office hours this last week, um, you know, one one person in there had been trying to get in front of this VP for two years. Used my system, got a, has a lunch meeting coming up with them. A lunch meeting. Really, that's all with an email, no phone, no nothing, a one line email. He gets that type of results. That's what I'm talking about is a new, it's not a new way. It's the old way of selling human to human and understanding how to connect and engage with people. Not this, oh, this endless, you know, pitching that just doesn't work anymore. Also, if you if you got a sales team and you want to learn how the complex sale really works inside your com- customer's company and how do you control that? How do you add direction, momentum and control? Check out the my my course closing the complex sale. It's a year-long course where I take you through your deals. We dissect them and I show you exactly what to do, how to prevent all the things that are going to go wrong. You know they're going to happen. It's too hard to repair. There's, you can repair them, but it's really hard. It's like, you know, once you bend a piece of metal, it's really hard to get it back to the way it used to be. But it sure is easy to prevent that bending of the metal. Also, connect up with me on LinkedIn, Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn. Uh, the YouTube channel, Maverick Method on YouTube. Got lots of funny stuff coming out there. Also, follow me on LinkedIn. I, I put out a funny video every morning around 1030 Eastern Time. Also got lots of, uh, you know, pulse posts there and the brutal truth about sales and selling. Have your sales team listen to that. We're talking about uh, what's going on in Q2 uh, and how do you really manage Q2 differently than the rest of the other quarters of the year and maximize your number. Also, the producer of Mad Men, the TV show, an advertising veteran who turned TV producer, who now has his own agency and wrote a book uh, about how to persuade people. A really interesting guy. One of my favorite interviews is coming up on this show uh, probably within a week. So stick tight. Uh, make sure you connect up with me. Thanks for listening and tell a friend about the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast at b2brevenue.com.